Good morning. Uh, my name is Ed Olms. Welcome to the service from the Unitarian Society of Northampton and Florence. Uh, my name is Ed Olmsted, and I am the vice president and also a member of the Climate Action Group and the COVID uh, response team, among us, amongst other things. It's wonderful to see you here this morning in the Great Hall and online. Thank you to everyone who is helping to make this service happen. If you are new or returning after a time away, we're very glad you're here. Feel free to fill out a welcome card, uh, which you can put in the offering plate later in the service. There's also an online version that you can fi find through the link in the chat. If you do that, we will put you on our email list so you can receive information about all of our activities. We strive to be a congregation that welcomes people of all ages, races, beliefs, religious beliefs, backgrounds, sexual orientations, gender identities, and abilities. We belong to the Universe, Unitarian Universalist Association of Congregations and we are guided and inspired by its values and principles. Our values and principle move us to remember that we in Northampton inhabit unceded land of the Pecumtuck and Nipmuc peoples. They remind us to acknowledge our responsibility to face the legacies of dispossession and systemic racism that are part of our collective history, even as we also affirm and celebrate the legacies that inspire us. Yael Petri is our guest speaker today. Yael lives here in the Valley and has been certified as a compassionate listening facilitator since 2004. She has led and co-led a number of CL delegations to Israel-Palestine. This morning, she will tell us about a recent compassionate listening delegation she led in Alabama. I'm very happy to welcome her. For families, classes are happening for crawling babies through eighth graders. Early childhood and middle school classes, fifth through eighth grade, now start downstairs. Kindergarten through fourth graders start in the Great Hall and go downstairs together after the story. Digit toy tools and drawing supplies are available at the back entrance for everyone who needs them or wants them. You'll find a color splotch on the back of your order of meeting. It's an invitation to join a conversation group with the same colored splotch, people, people with the same colored splotch right after the service. Green and purple will be here in the Great Hall and uh, orange and red are in the parlor through that door. And uh, you're in the parlor, yes, okay. In the part, if you have a, an unmarked clean sheet, you may join any group you like, and it's all voluntary to begin with, but nice to be able to maybe meet some new people if you want to and have a discussion uh, check in. We're here to celebrate and to reflect and to support one another in sustaining hope and upholding our values. If you are on Zoom, we ask that you please keep your videos off except during the greeting. And if you're in the Great Hall, Thank you for wearing a mask. And now we will begin our service.
Our opening words are by Susan Frederick Gray, the president of the Unitarian Universalist Association. An ethic of love lives at the heart of our UU faith. It reflects the core question, how are we to live? It calls us to courage, to continually grow and learn and adapt in ways that foster love and justice. It is not a weak or sentimental love. It burns like the fire at the center of our chalice. It is fierce in a way that compels us to demand justice in the world, but also fierce in how it calls us to courageous conversations, to radical practices, to welcome, compassion, forgiveness, and belonging. Let this love burn brightly in our hearts, in all our communities. May we live the bold, brave, living, loving theology that lives at the heart of our tradition. I invite everyone to rise in body or spirit for our chalice lighting, and then we'll remain standing after that for the first hymn. We light our chalice as a beacon of hope, a sign of our quest for truth and meaning. We light our chalice as a beacon of love in celebration of the life we share together. Our hymn is from you I receive. It's very simple. We will hear an introduction and then we'll sing it through four times, perhaps, uh, taking in more of its meaning each time. story. Let's see if we can get the book up here. There we go. The rabbit listened. One day, Taylor decided to build something. Something new. Something special. Something amazing. Taylor was so proud. But then, out of nowhere, things came crashing down. The chicken was the first to notice. Cluck, cluck, what a shame. I'm so sorry, so sorry. So sorry, this happened. Let's talk, let's talk, talk about it. Cluck, cluck. But Taylor didn't feel like talking, so the chicken left. Next came the bear. Grr, rawr, how horrible. I bet you feel so angry. Let's talk about it. Grr, rawr, rawr. 
But Taylor didn't feel like shouting. So the bear left. The elephant knew what to do. Chump, ta da, I can fix this. We just need to remember exactly the way things were. But Taylor didn't feel like remembering, so the elephant left. One by one they came. The hyena, hey, hey, let's laugh about it. The ostrich, gulped, let's hide and pretend nothing happened. The kangaroo, tsk, tsk, what a mess, let's throw it all away. And the snake, shh, let's knock it, let's knock down someone else's. But Taylor didn't feel like doing anything with anybody, so eventually they all left until Taylor was alone. In the quiet, Taylor didn't even notice the rabbit, but it moved closer and closer until Taylor could feel its warm body. Together, they sat in silence until Taylor said, please stay with me. The rabbit listened. The rabbit listened as Taylor talked. The rabbit listened as Taylor shouted. The rabbit listened as Taylor remembered and laughed. The rabbit listened to Taylor's plans to hide, to throw everything away, to ruin things for someone else. Through it all, the rabbit never left. And when the time was right, the rabbit listened to Taylor's plan to build kin. Can't wait, Taylor said. It's gonna be amazing. Yeah, El will lead us in our next hymn. That's the best story I ever heard to illustrate compassionate listening. But since you like to sing, um, we thought we would just do one together, which many of you probably already know. It was inspired by Ella Baker and recorded by a number of people, but it's just a simple little song called Give Light. And it's one of those songs where you just switch one word or maybe two words in the next verse. So it's really easy to learn. Do any of you know it yet? Not yet, okay. <clears throat> it goes like this, I'll just sing the first verse for you and then we'll sing that together and then I'll give you the prompts for the second verse and the last one, okay? Okay. You, okay. <laughs> <laughs> me, me, me. Okay, it goes like this. Give light and people will find the way. Give light and people will find the way. Give light and people will find the way. People will find the way, I do believe. Got it? Okay, let's sing that. Give light and people will find the way. Give light and people will find a way. Give light and people will find a way. People will find a way, I do believe. Love. Give love and people will find a way. Give love and people will find a way. Give love and people will find a way. People will find a way, I do believe. Last one, stand together. Stand together and people will find a way. Stand together and people will find a way. Stand together and people will find the way. People will find the way, I do believe. 
give light, give light, and people will find a way. Give light, and people will find a way. Give light, and people will find a way. People will find the way I do believe, and people will find the way I do believe. Thank you. Now it's time for anyone going to religious education. Is this, am I in the right place? No, no, now it's time for us to greet one another. <laughs> I knew that didn't sound right. Okay. Those of you in the Great Hall, please wave to the back if you're willing and uh, greet each other. And maybe we'll get to switch to the gallery view and see people online if you turn on your videos. Thank you, everyone. Nice to see everybody. And now it's time for anyone going to religious education activities to leave us. Please join in helping sing them out. a little reading that I hope you'll find as meaningful as I do. I think you will. It's called The Great Turning. You asked me to tell you about the great turning of how we saved the world from disaster. The answer is both simple and complex. We turned. For hundreds of years, we had turned away as life on earth grew more precarious. We turned away from the homeless men on the streets, the stench from the river, the children orphaned in Iraq, and the mothers dying of AIDS in Africa. We turned away because that's what we had been taught to do, to turn away from our pain from the hurt in others' eyes, from the drunken father or that friend betrayed. Always we were told in actions louder than words to turn away, turn away, don't look. And so we became a lonely people, caught up in a world moving too quickly, too mindlessly toward its own demise until it seemed that there was no safe place left. No place, inside or out, that did not remind us of our fear 
and our terror, despair, grief, and loss. Yet, on one of those days, someone did turn, turn to face that pain, turn to face the stranger, turn to look at the smoldering world and the hatred seething in too many eyes, turn to face himself and herself. And then another turned and another and yet another. And as they wept, they took each other's hands until whole groups of people were turning, young and old, gay and straight, people of all colors, all nations, all religions, turning not only to the pain and to the hurt, but to the beauty and gratitude and love turning to one another with forgiveness and a longing for peace in their hearts. Thank you. I, I'm Bill Diamond from the Climate Action Group. I have three things I want to talk to you about in the next minute. The first is, and I won't quote just to save time, about 10 days ago, the, the editorial board of the Washington Post talked about the fact that even though we haven't hit our climate targets, Every tenth of a degree that we save, that we keep from happening, will make an enormous difference and billions of lives are at stake. The second thing I wanted to show you is that the second thing I wanted to show you was that the Climate Action Group is working against the Eversource pipeline. Here's a 30 second excerpt from that. And later I'll show you how you can view uh, the full five minute video against the pipeline in Springfield and Longmeadow. So here is the 30 second excerpt. Going through some of the most fragile neighborhoods in the Commonwealth. This isn't just about a pipeline that's going underground just in case the other one breaks down. This is about people and it's about people being healthy. We know that gas lines all leak. We know that they leak methane, which is toxic. So the more pipelines that we have, the more pollutants will be in the air. Historically, Springfield has said to be the asthma capital of the, the U.S. in 2018 and 2019. Never going through some of the most fragile neighborhoods in the Commonwealth. This isn't just a The third thing that I wanted to show you was the most recent issue of the UU World. And here is the link to the UU World. It is all about facing the climate crisis. What I'm going to do is put the link to this entire social justice minute in the chat and you can look at the full video and also link to the uu world so you can see all of this thank you for your time all right sorry about that in the great hall people heard it on zoom and the techno technological difficulty we could not over um, to be able to hear it here. Um, let's see. Okay. 
Our generosity makes everything we do possible, and it helps us support organizations and movements in the greater community. Half of the proceeds of each week's offerings support the society's operating budget, and half are shared outside of our walls. You can mail in a check, donate online, or put your contribution in the offering plates the ushers will be passing around. The offering will now be given and gratefully received. A little meditation. When, I, when I'm asked to do a meditation, I often think um, how nice they are for grounding us and centering us and calming us. And my mind goes to trees. I think many of you have probably experienced going out into a forest and just feeling the calmness there. And trees are so special, a friend of mine says, because they are rooted, you know, very rooted, and all of the roots underneath the ground intertwine the way we do. And the trees always reach for the light. They grow up and they look for the light. And my friend says, that's our lesson. Look for the light always. And then just coincidentally, yesterday, I spoke with some friends in Israel, Palestine. It is uh, olive season right now. They're picking the olives and making beautiful olive oil. And it's such a gift, it's richness. They call it green gold. It's another gift from the trees that give us so many gifts. So I guess in centering and thinking about trees, I just invite us to spend a moment thinking about the last time you ever went out and took your place next to a tree. And think about the next time you can do that because that groundedness, that centeredness, you can go back to all the time. Even if you only imagine it, you can go there and have that be right inside of you, that calm. Think about that for a moment.
think about. Thanks for the reminder to speak up. Can you hear me now? It feels to me like I'm yelling, but I, thank you. Okay. This is just something that uh, a person I find to be very interesting and inspirational uh, said. Her name is Rachel Naomi Remen. You might recognize my father's kitchen table wisdom and my father's story. Yeah, lovely stories about her life as a doctor. And so she says, in this culture, the soul and the heart too often go homeless. Listening creates a holy silence. When you listen generously to people, they can hear the truth in themselves, often for the first time. And in the silence of listening, you can know yourself in everyone. Eventually, you may be able to hear in everyone and beyond everyone the unseen singing softly to itself and to you. I invite you to rise in body or spirit to sing him. 352, find a stillness. Okay. Changing our world from the inside out, or another way to put it is healing our world from the inside out. So I'm calling on all peacemakers. I think we have a room full of them right here. Um, part of peacemaking is uh, bringing about reconciliation, and that's not always easy. Um, in, a, in a situation of conflict, you've got two sides maybe in conflict and maybe they don't want to reconcile. So that's pretty hard. We need a radically new way of communicating with each other, especially when we're in conflict. 
a radically new way of being in the world. It's been said that the most revolutionary thing that we can do now is to cultivate radical compassion. I think I even saw a bumper sticker with that. So what is compassion anyway? Some people think it means pity. Um, Ed mentioned that, you know, a bunch of us just went down to Alabama. And when I first spoke with one of our speakers uh, down there, he said, compassionate listeners, uh-oh. It's another bunch of do-gooder northerners coming down here to tell us how to live our lives. He thought compassion meant pity. Pity. Doesn't mean pity. As Desmond Tutu teaches us, compassion is only possible between equals. So what is it? Our working definition for compassion is a sense of shared suffering combined with a desire to alleviate that suffering or to reduce the suffering of other people, whether in our immediate families, communities, countries, or in some far-flung spot on the, on the globe. Many of us are aware of suffering and justice all around us, we live in a very violent world. Why is it so violent? We have our ideas about where the violence can be coming from. Perhaps it's fear, losing control, anger, frustration at perceived injustices or injuries. Years ago, I was part of a peace organization and it didn't take me long to find out that many of the people that were in this peace organization community were not peaceable at all. <laughs> Maybe some of you have had the same kind of experience, but there was a lot of righteous anger and you know, indignance and sometimes even violence in word or deed, and it didn't feel right to me. So one day, Someone called me and said, hey, would you like to participate in an introduction to a practice called compassionate listening? I thought, sure, why not? And uh, Thich Nhat Hanh, who was one of the inspirations for this, in fact, he coined the phrase compassionate listening, um, the Buddhist monk whose writings are becoming more and more well known now, many of you might know of him, but he said, once we take sides in a conflict, we have forfeited our roles as peacemakers. Well, Jean Knudsen Hoffman, who kind of developed the initial curriculum of compassionate listening, she was inspired by him, she studied with him, and she just made the statement that a terrorist is someone whose story we have not heard. And how's that for radical? She went on to develop the idea that we must cultivate compassion for both those who are suffering. I mean, that's pretty easy. We do that readily. Um, but also for the ones who are causing it. That's harder. Whoa. <laughs> Compassionate listening looks at solving conflict as though it were a very large jigsaw puzzle. Nobody has all of the picture. Nobody has all of the truth. Everybody has a little bit. And unless we listen to everyone, even those that we really can't stand what they're saying, if we don't listen, we're never going to have the big picture. So as you can imagine, this is not easy to do. Not only are we going to listen, you know, and sit there and go, yeah, yeah, I'm waiting for him to finish so I can say, no. What we do is 
learn how to open our hearts as well as our ears and to be totally present, totally present to the person who is speaking or acting in such a way that we might find it ob objectionable. And not only that, part of the practice of compassionate listening is to learn how to find what might be common points of our humanity, common values that we can identify with. Um, and we look for those as positive motivations for words or deeds that we really don't want to accept. So um, a little story that I can tell you to illustrate is the one of my friend Suleiman Al-Hamri. He's a Palestinian. And a few years ago, some years ago, Suleiman was 14 years old, and his father and he came to a checkpoint. You know, there are hundreds of checkpoints in Israel and Palestine, especially Palestine. Um, and so it was a young woman, an Israeli soldier, 18 years old, on this checkpoint. And Suleiman and his dad got to the checkpoint, and they had to stop. And the young woman, the soldier, told Suleiman's father to take off his shirt because she wanted to make sure there was nothing under it. You know, that would be... Well, Suleiman took a knife that he had in his pocket and lunged at the soldier. He was enraged at this kind of thing. You can imagine in that very traditional society, modesty is really important. Respect for elders is really important, family, and things like that. So when we start looking for those things that we can understand and identify with, we can sort of understand why Suleiman did what he did. It does not mean that we condone it. But in being able to connect with him about how important it is to respect your elders, your father especially, um, there was a way in. Suleiman went to prison for a few years, became a peacenik. <laughs> he's one of the founders of Combatants for Peace. You may have heard of them. And he's a good friend. So this is what we work on doing. And we have thousands of opportunities to do it every day, I think. And the other thing is that we found with Compassionate Listening pro Process your practice is that if you really listen without interrupting and without saying, oh, wait, I'll tell you what happened to me. You know, we don't do that. Um, just really listen as that little rabbit did. Um, then a person's tension comes down. Violence comes down the level. And they might even be been willing to listen to you, you know? It's, it works like that. So part of compassionate listening is also speaking. Speaking in such a way that a person can hear you without feeling threatened. What does speaking from the heart actually mean? If you think about, think back to a moment when you were in really nice connection with someone that you cared about, or maybe even in a beautiful place outside, and you just felt so good. It felt so good. Can you think of a moment like that? It might have happened already this morning, but it could be back in your childhood. Just a moment when you really felt connected to the person you were with or to a pet. I do it with my cat all the time or outside, and think about how that feels. How does it feel? Anybody have any ideas? I mean, just physically, how does that feel to be in that place? It feels warm, and, you know, cared for, and maybe expansive or light. That's what it's like to feel like you're in your heart. 
And so when we're practicing compassionate listening, even in the heat of conflict, we learn and we practice to go there. Go there. And everything we do is from that place. That's what it means to listen with the heart and to speak with the heart. I wonder if you know that even before we're born, the first organ that starts to be formed is the heart. And we're told that if you put two cardiac cells in a petri dish, they'll start beating together in sync. That desire for connection is that strong. And so that's what we're banking on with compassionate listening. Um, you know, we're born with that. We're born with that open heart, with that pure core from which we want to, to love and be loved. But almost from the moment that we're born, things start to happen to us that, that hurt. Maybe, maybe it's abuse of some kind. Um, it could be trauma or loneliness or isms such as racism, sexism, ageism, ableism, many, many things around us can hurt. And so what we do is we start building up defenses, you know, and developing strategies to protect ourselves from being hurt again. And each one's kind of like a, a brick, but you know, you can, you can do fight or flight you can withdraw, you can argue, you can do a lot of things to try to protect yourself, but what you do in doing that is separate yourself from other people. So in compassionate listening, what we're trying to do is take down the bricks, take down the wall, and get back to relating to each other in a real way, heart to heart, in a real way. Um, and it means you can even say difficult things if you learn how to say them kindly and clearly. And that's what we need to settle conflict sometimes. Um, we are also not only working on getting there ourselves into our own tender heart, we're looking to find that place in other people too. Humbling. Um, let me see how much time I have left. Okay, got to wrap up. Do you know? I, I will just tell you a little story that um, still makes me smile. And I know Susan has heard this before, but I'm going to tell you about what happened when my car broke down some time ago in Rhode Island. And it's, it wasn't just breaking down, it's a Prius with one of those big old, you know, batteries in the back. And I had left the passenger door open a little bit because I was in such a hurry to get into my friend's car. And we went away for three days to go watch whales. And so I came back and the car was deader than a doornail. And so I called AAA, thank heavens for AAA, and they couldn't find anybody that would really come for a long time. Finally, this little guy shows up with a tow truck, little blonde fellow, one of those really, really vehement people. You, you may have met them, you know, they kind of flail a lot, you know, maybe spit a bit, but he was, um, he, he was like that. And he said, you know, I, I, people think I'm stupid, but I know what I'm doing and I, you know, I'll show you I can take care of this. Well, somehow he did get the car onto the tow truck, and um, he kept talking about how he hated corporations. And I said to myself, don't say the AAA is a corporation at this point. So, um, and so we started back, it was a hundred miles back to where I live from this place. And I, and he was just, going off and and we got in the cab and he said 
I hate corporations, they make me turn my shirt upside down. And I said upside down, what's wrong with your shirt? It's a Trump shirt, I'm a Trump supporter. And they make me turn my shirt upside down. So I, I thought, oh, this is gonna be a long hundred miles back. But, but, but I let him go, you know, and he was railing on about the idiot in the White House and how he has to pay more taxes and all kinds of things. And I just let him go. I put on my compassionate listening hat, didn't try to argue or anything like that, I let him go. And finally, about 60 miles later, <laughs> I said, you know, that is, it's really maddening when you have to pay taxes you don't think are fair, right? You know, it's, it is maddening, I get that. And he said, and people think I'm terrible because I'm a Trump supporter. I said, I don't think you're terrible because you're a Trump supporter. I think you're a very good fellow. Okay, and then I said, and do you know that in the Congress, the way things work, you know, there are, there's half of the Congress which wants to do things which at least I think are progressive and would help us in terms of taxes and health care and everything else. And then there's the other half of Congress that won't let them. They vote against these things all the time. And there was this stunned silence from this young fellow. And he said, do you mean I'm mad at the wrong people? <laughs> I said, well, maybe. And eventually he started to tell me about himself. He had come from Lebanon. He had uh, been a child soldier at the age of 11. He'd been handed an, a rifle to fight the Syrians. And then the Syrians captured him and put him in prison for several years as a child. And he finally made it here, went straight into the Marine Corps. And I won't repeat what I asked him about that. It was about his language and choice of words. But I said, well, and, he, and his wife had just died. And so I said, well, do you have children? Grand yes, I have two children. Grandchildren? Yes. Um, do you get to see them? He said, well, they live with me now. And I said, why? He said, because my two daughters are emergency room nurses and they're taking care of people with COVID. And he got my car started. I don't know how, because it wasn't supposed to be possible, but he did it. And I don't know where he is now, but I will never forget that fellow. And you can just see how it would have turned out differently if we had argued about politics. And so that's, that's the gist of it. You look for the humanity. And I just want to say, thank you for listening to me, and I just want to say that um, we're not done with Alabama. We're going back in April, and you're all invited to come. It's quite a wonderful experience to meet all kinds of people and to listen to them and make friends with people that you never would have thought you'd be in the same room with and really value them. Thank you. As we're getting ready to sing our final hymn, which is uh, number 159, This Is My Song, I just want to remind you that uh, on your orders of meeting, there's a colored splotch on the back, uh, which is an invitation to join the conversation group with people of the same, that have the same color splotch. Uh, green and purple here in the Great Hall, and orange and red are in the parlor, or whatever you wish to do is gathering after the service.
One last little poem. You okay? It's called Clearing by Martha Pulsoleo. Do not try to save the whole world or do anything grandiose. Instead, create a clearing in the dense forest of your life and wait there patiently until the song that is your life falls into your cupped hands and you recognize it and you greet it. Only then will you know how to give yourself to the world so worthy of rescue. Thank mm -hmm. you.